evening we have decided to do something that we've been thinking about for quite a while. And that is bring together answers to a number of questions that have been asked through the years of a rather personal and intimate nature concerning healing. And as a preamble to this, we would like to go back a little bit into some of the ancient concepts that were taught in India and Greece, Egypt and other nations of the ancient world, not because we must accept these concepts, but because where long and thoughtful belief has been held by persons of extraordinary erudition, we should at least understand these beliefs, and see what they mean to us, and what we can do with them in our time. So we're going to begin with a matter which perhaps does not seem to bear directly upon the subject, but I think it will unfold its meaning. There are in the Christian theological world, certain groups who are known as sacramentarians. These are persons who hold the particular validity of sacraments, as these were anciently established by the Church, and especially the sacrament of ordination. <coughs> and in turn, from this sacrament, that upon which it depends for its validity, namely, the concept or doctrine of the apostolic succession. Now, in our modern Western thinking, we are not much inclined today, except for one or two religious groups, to give this matter very much consideration. Yet we know that it is referred to in the New Testament in this sense, that Jesus ordained his disciples and followers and declared that through them there would be a descent of his power. And in ordination, from that time on, the usual and most common ritual was that of the perpetuation or the conferring of the apostolic success, uh, succession by the laying on of hands. In other words, in the ordination of a priest, certain persons previously ordained, usually two or more bishops, proclaim by the laying on of hands the descent of the apostolic succession by an unbroken line for a period of over 1900 years. Now we might say that this has no validity, that it exists only within the imagination of the individual. But we might then turn, for example, to other nations to see whether a parallel condition or belief exists among them. We know that it did exist in Egypt. We know also that a form of it exists in India, and that rituals involving the perpetuation of a power through the conveying by bodily contact or by magnetic instruments of some kind, that this concept was strongly held. Out of it has come one of the beliefs that is also passed into limbo, but which for centuries affected the art of healing. For as you will remember in the Christian uh, dispensation, the disciples, followers, the hierarchy that came after, all together were admonished, among other things, to heal the sick. And it was assumed in the early growth and development of the church that the laying on of hands and the perpetuation or conferring of the apostolic succession 
carried with it the power to heal in the name of Christ. <coughs> in Egypt, the Pharaoh was the head of the state, but he also was required to be a member of the state mysteries. In other words, he had to be an initiate of one of the priestly colleges. This was true also of Greek rulers. And for many, many centuries, ages, of East Indian rulers and also Chinese rulers. The princely person, the pharaoh, was by birth entitled to initiation into the state rituals or rites. But the Egyptian priests were quite aware of the fact that because a man was born to the kingship of the double empire, it was not necessarily true that he was a scholar, a mystic, a philosopher. He might be inclined in these directions, but he carried the burden of the state. So in the Egyptian ritual, it was customary for the priests to confer upon Pharaoh certain rights, orders, and privileges which were not his own, but through which he acted only upon the authority of the priesthood. The great school or assembly of the priests, which later was to become the College of the Cardinals in the Christian Church, therefore in solemn session gathered about Pharaoh at the time of his ordination, and each one placed his hand upon the emperor or king, and conferred upon him the descent of the powers of the order, so far as these powers were necessary to the administration of the state. The hierophants told the Pharaoh very frankly that he did not hold these powers of himself, he had not earned them, he had not merited them, therefore he could not use them upon himself. To use them upon himself was sorcery. He was, however, as the custodian and keeper of his people, in a constant position or need for certain knowledge beyond his own. This knowledge, therefore, was loaned to him made available to him through the power of the priests, who were able to transmit the certain of their own energies to him. Such was in truth the belief of the Egyptian people, and probably is the origin of the idea of the apostolic succession. Out of this belief came something that dominated in Europe for a long time, and this thing was called the divine right of kings. This divine right included throughout Europe, also Asia, North Africa, the power of kings to heal the sick. This was one of the oldest of the privileges of rulership. Not because the king himself was either especially wise or learned, but because he was acting under the authority of a power loaned to him or invested in him because of the background, because of the mystical factors, usually the great school of the adepts, behind him and working through him and maintaining him. They therefore, through their power, conferred upon him this means of serving others, but not of saving himself. Therefore, as late as the 18th century in Europe, kings at regular intervals performed rituals of healing by the laying on of hands. Kings whose characters were not what we would call particularly savory possessed this ability. 
along with other rites and rituals given to them by the elaborate rituals of coronation in which the king received ordination. All kings were ordained priests, whether they lived a priestly life or not, and through ordination it was believed that they gained the power to heal the sick. One of the most common expressions for this was the touching for king's evil, which was a common practice for probably 500 years. In this case, the kingly power was sometimes limited. Certain monarchs were known to be able to cure certain ailments, and usually on state occasions in the presence of the religious, and also in the presence of their people, they went through a ritualistic symbol of healing the sickness of their people. There are reports of the early kings of England, who on these occasions touched as many as four or five thousand persons in one day. And the reports were also that these persons gained immediate relief. Now this opens us uh, to several situations that are rather interesting for us to think about. First of all, the modern psychologist, hearing all of these stories, would pronounce them fables and would declare that any value that might lie in the royal touch or anything of that nature would be purely psychological. That the people, having tremendous veneration for their rulers, were profoundly influenced by the belief that if they could participate in this rite, that they would be peculiarly and wonderfully helped. There is all probability that some psychological factors were present, and this may have been especially true in decadent periods. But as we go back to the early sources, we cannot assume that some of the world's most brilliant and profound thinkers would have been completely deceived by this factor. And the reports and records that we have would indicate that in some way uh, there was a transmission of energy. Something happened. Something perhaps which has never been fully explained, and something which as a doctrine is still clung to by certain churches, particularly the Eastern Church, namely that the official function of the Mass carries with it a focusing of energies upon the vestments of the clergy and the radiation of this energy over the congregation. This is the reason why the uh, weavings of gold and silver and the sunburst so often appear upon the vestments of the clergy. All these old beliefs go back to something. What do they go back to? One of the most initi initiated and interesting thinkers to deal with this subject was Paracelsus von Hohenheim, the great Swiss physician, who, of all men, perhaps, uh, must be considered most entitled to an opinion, inasmuch as in the la level of science, and in more modern times, he was probably the most remarkable exponent of unusual and almost unbelievable methods of therapy. He depended very much less upon medicines than upon certain forces uh, which exist in nature. Paracelsus tells us in his crude, difficult, and cumbersome language, as painfully written out by his disciple Oswald Krolus, that there exists in nature a fluid, that this fluid is neither electrical nor magnetic, and perhaps the best term that can be given for it is that it is a vital fluid. This fluid is everywhere present, so that all things seem to be dwelling in a sea of this peculiar fluidic life energy. This energy is not in motion, as most energies. It does not vitalize itself by manifesting activity. It seems to be a vast, placid sea of glass, and within it as within the interior of a great ocean, 
All living things exist depending upon it for every vital function of life. It is this universal vitality, this relic power of Lord Lytton, this mysterious universal energy, uh, this principle of ever-present, life-sustaining power that Paracelsus declared to lie at the root of a wide variety of phenomena commonly practiced by human beings. The Indian philosopher believes the same thing, for he feels that this is the peculiar energy which he is able to direct and control when he makes the mango tree grow in half an hour. He also believes that it is the energy by means of which he is able to neutralize the action of the law of gravity. It is furthermore the energy by means of which he can transport his mind into various places under various conditions. Buddha gives us some material relating to this subject, but it is rather uh, peculiar and we have to understand it. Uh, one point he makes, for example, is when he is discussing with a certain king a phase of his doctrine, and the subject comes up relating to distance or intervals between things. And this king tries to find certain definitions of qualitative interval, that is, interval not measured by distance alone. Buddha explains to him uh, that he may bear two things in mind. This king was born in a certain village 30 miles away. Later in life, he became ruler of a country, and his throne was a thousand miles away. And on the level of philosophic distance, the question as to the power of energy was brought up. And Buddha said, how long does it take you to vitalize within your own self the, the picture of the town in which you were born, which is 30 miles away? And the king said, oh, I can do so almost instantly. Now, says Buddha, how long will it take you to energize the picture of the capital of your country where you now live, which is a thousand miles away? The king said, I can do so instantly. And Buddha says, does it take longer then to visualize a place a thousand miles away than it does to visualize a place thirty miles away? The king said, no, it takes no longer. Also then, as the philosophy is expanded by Nagarjuna, the question arises is, uh, is, in the visualization or projection of energy, does it take longer to go a thousand miles than it does 30 miles. And the old Buddhist patriarch said, no, it does not. Consequently, one of the peculiar uh, values or virtues of this life principle, this vital field of energy, is that within it, all things are both immediate and remote simultaneously. There is no such thing as interval or distance as we know it. This fact comes to us a little through the gradual researches in extrasensory perception, when we come to realize that thought can travel incredible distances practically instantaneously. How does it travel? Why does it travel? We can go to a more physical and uh, obvious analogy when we speak of a radio program. We find, for example, that a vibration sent out from a radio station, even a short wave station, perhaps especially a short wave station, uh, from Los Angeles, can be picked up almost instantly, with a very slight lapse of time, uh, we'll say in Mongolia, or in some remote part of Russia, or in Tibet, or in South America. This is not the greater part of it, because we might assume that sound travels with great rapidity, particularly vibration. But we have another interesting thing. How does it happen that sound shot into the air does not act like a shotgun shell, 
Why is it not dissipated into space? What holds this sound in pattern and form so that it travels with immense speed over vast distances? Why does it arrive in condition to be immediately reinterpreted? What are the boundaries that would prevent it from being dissipated on the way? What might cause it to break down and simply become part of the great river of sound that must exist in space? How does it retain its identity? The only answer seems to be that it is very much again like a Victrola record. That there is some kind of a wax, some kind of a substance in nature, by which the order of this sound is preserved inviolate over any distance or for a vast period of time. Consequently, that this sound is moving in a kind of energy, and this energy is formal. That is, it possesses the power of preserving the integration of the sound vibratory pattern, so that this pattern is delivered <coughs> at a great distance without being destroyed or without being injured. Buddha and other Eastern philosophers have held the same as true of thought, but thought moving through space cannot necessarily be held in bondage by any medium that we know, but that it moves in a field, and that this field permits it to travel without being disintegrated, dissolved, or absorbed en route, so that this thought pattern will carry, like the sound of the radio or the short wave set, to almost any part of the known world and even to spheres of space beyond our comprehension. This is because what we call emptiness around us is not emptiness at all, but a highly organized field of energy. And this energy, according to the ancients, played a very important part in healing. It was the directing and controlling of certain vibrations through means of this energy field that they used in many of their experiments and in their uh, therapeutic processes. And also it is the continuance of this energy on an oblique line uh, which the ancients explained as the real meaning for the descent of the sacraments by the apostolic succession or the transference of a certain form in energy from one generation to another. That these patterns did exist and that these patterns were conveyed or conferred in certain ways, and that this conferring <coughs> involved the particular seat or throne <coughs> of this pure vital energy in the human body, which is the bloodstream. Now let us pause, and I want to take up these questions that a number of people have asked, but I wanted to do it against the background of the concept of this energy field. This field that we can call divine energy, if we are religiously inclined, universal energy, if we are philosophically consigned, uh, uh, concerned, and simply energy, if we are physically polarized as materialists. But in any case, it is the same material, the same substance, the same essence. And it contains within itself not only life, but the power of transmitting vibration. And as such, it was recognized and known from the earliest times. Now people come to you, come to me, and they say, Could I be a healer? Could I be a capable of performing religious healing? This problem bears in itself upon the relationship of the individual's control of certain phases of this light energy of the world. Your man might come to you and look at you and say, can I be a violinist? And if you were a, a reasonable thinker, you would probably say to yourself, probably this man can be anything. But with a little less optimism and a little more scholarly thinking, we would say that to be an outstanding violinist or to achieve in this field, there must be aptitude. An aptitude means that there must be a certain kind of integration within the elements and nature of that person. 
he must respond particularly to certain impulses in his own emotional psychic life, his own spiritual overtones, and he must have certain uh, rapport with energy around him. And he must also have a kind of coordination. In other words, if his coordination is poor, he will have difficulty in almost any form of musical expression. He must also have a certain additional discipline by means of which his natural aptitudes are brought into a mature state. Therefore we can say that all human beings, while they are alive, have certain adjustments to energy. They have also certain energy moving through themselves. But this energy is more available to them in some respects than it is in other respects. And this difference is as basic a part of individuality as any other peculiarity or particularity which we observe in the human being. Thus we know that on the pure level of energy, some people have more energy available than others. We know that some find it easier to energize memory than others. Some find it easier to energize reflection than others. Now, what is this energizing agent? Most philosophies have assumed, and most religions also, that the ability to move energy, to move this vital fluid uh, in which we exist, and which becomes the basis of so many of our activities, the power to do this is invested essentially in the natural aptitude of the human will. A will is that part of man's compound integration by which he can project, precipitate, or move. Will leads, leads to motion. It also leads to activity of a specialized kind. Thus we can say in a very simple way that if a man wants to be a musician, he must have enough willpower to practice, dedicate his life to that purpose, energize his resolution, and keep going. Therefore, one of the functions of will is to energize or vitalize resolution or determination. Another function of will is to perpetuate or cause a continuous kind of motion in the field of energy. Will, consequently, has a peculiar and direct relationship with energy, and it is possible through the development of the will, as the Tibetan magician will tell you, that it is possible through the will to direct the motion of this vital material. More completely, it is possible through will to put this vital material in motion, because motion is not inherent to itself. It is in a state of perpetual suspension. Will, by certain processes, moves or organizes energy. Another important attribute of this energy field, and one that we will come nearer and nearer to as we proceed in our own uh, evolution on any level, scientific or otherwise, is that this energy retains within itself also a photographic or reproductive power. Because this is not primarily energy in motion, but is energy in suspension. Any change, any modification wrought upon it by the active agency of will, either the will of man or the will of the gods, causes mutations in the energy field which remain constant from that time on. Therefore, actually, the energy field of the world retains at all times a complete picture or a complete record or a complete perpetual statement of all things that have been and are. This energy field, therefore, once it is molded by will into a pattern, retains that pattern as though we had carved a likeness upon stone, only much more so and much more permanently. If, then, we begin to exercise the various attributes of this power to mold energy, to direct it, 
to move it, to condition it. The result is extremely important. This brings us then to the direct answer to the question, can anyone and everyone be a healer? To a degree. But there are certain persons in whom this power is more highly specialized than others. And those in whom it is most highly specialized are generally speaking, according to the Buddhist and Greek concepts, those who have for the longest period of time in life after life been directly associated with the healing arts. In other words, to a degree, man's power to heal from resources of energy within himself or his ability to control and mold the energy of the environment around him is due to long, often unconscious but important and purposeful association with these energies. Perhaps he has never realized how he has used them, but he has gradually gained control of them. A good example of that is the highly skillful physician's intuitive diagnosis of sickness. The physician who is said to be born, not made, the individual in whom the instinct and power of healing is essentially strong, even on a physical level of medicine, has gradually observed that he has an increasing extrasensory grasp of sickness. He is able to know it, experience it, sense it. He is able to diagnose it, even without ordinary examination. He may also be able, by very sensitive uh, nervous reactions, uh, to locate the areas infected or affected in the body of the patient. Sometimes he knows how he does it, sometimes he does not know how he does it. But in any event, this peculiar aptitude in healing, like all other aptitudes, has a cause. And the cause must be equal to the effect, whether we know it or not. One other or two other things involve themselves in this particular subject. All things being otherwise equal, the individual being the product of his own previous existence and his own previous training, the more disciplined, the more enlightened, the more illumined he has gradually become inwardly, uh, the more direct rapport he has with the great energy fields of life through sympathy. He may not be aware of what it is, but he has within himself a sympathetic power, and this sympathy creates a closer and closer affinity. An affinity in this case means that he has within himself vibratory rates more and more harmonious with the energy field with which he is operating. And as this uh, vibratory rate is, a, is suitable to move or arrange or pattern this energy by usually a subconscious or very gentle impulse of the will, we find that the true healer, the born healer, is the person with a long background of unfoldment and growth within himself a background which he may not know that he possesses, that may never present itself to him through any visions or any remembrances, but simply through peculiar aptitudes in certain fields, as the sculptor has an instinctive and intuitive ability to, to discriminate formal structure and to copy or to reproduce through the skill of his own sensory perceptions difficult patterns of harmony, balance, and organization. These intuitive abilities, like all other mysterious powers, arise not from a mystery, but from increasing familiarity and contact over a long period of time, much of this time, however, not consciously remembered. So we may say that most people undoubtedly have certain healing powers, but that it is more developed in those in which there is evidence of specialization. 
and that it can be further developed even during the course of a lifetime by discipline and specialization at a given time, we also know to be true. Now in the study of the mysterious instrument by means of which we accomplish certain results in nature, we have mentioned the will. And the will, of course, is the power, the resolve, the determination, by means of which various activities are brought into existence and maintained. And the will also has other values or factors incorporated in its structure. And that is that it is a qualitative thing in which the individual wills from various levels of motivation within himself. Will may be strenuous or it may not be strenuous. But the will agent is moved by various levels of intensity in the nature of the, of the person who is going to exercise the will. Now let us think for a moment uh, how will could be influenced by a comparatively moderate and relaxed impulse, such as faith. Faith, strangely enough, has a tremendous power of will reaction because of all the different means by means of which we are able to energize attitudes, conclusions, or convictions, faith is perhaps the strongest, because faith renders energy almost immediately available, uh, without very much intellectual or emotional resistance. Wherever there is resistance or division within the nature, Energy is expended in the effort to restore the equilibrium of unbalanced parts. And this, therefore, makes energy less available for other reasons. In the nature of the average person, therefore, most of his energy field is dissipated in trying to keep himself in balance. He is constantly uh, in confusion within himself. His instincts, appetites, impulses, and attitudes run in contrary directions, and he must use his will resource in an effort to neutralize or synthesize these confused and discordant elements. If, however, through a simple uh, attitude such as faith, all argument, dissension, or inconsistency is blocked, or at least prevented from manifesting, then there is less energy or power required for the solution of conflict, and greater will or resolution can be focused upon some one given thing, particularly upon that given thing which is the direct object of faith. Now on a rational or philosophical level, will is moved by reason, and reason is the propriety of a thing. Will moved by reason is impelled to the reasonable to action consistent with intellectual consistency. Thus the reason, by judgment, uh, by understanding, achieves certain resolution, and resolution is another name for will, because resolution is qualitative will activity. If also we have, uh, beyond the philosophical level, we have the scientific, or that type of will energy, which arises from the impact of factuality upon the individual. Influencing, molding, moderating, modifying, con and constantly conditioning uh, of the uses which he intends to make of energy. Because materialism, of course, limits the directing of energy against any object or subject which is outside of the sphere of materialistic interest. Thus, factuality becomes the, impu the impulse behind the scientist who dedicates his life to contributing new facts or making new applications of old facts, in this way attempting to advance the human purpose.
factuality, reason, faith, then, become ways in which will is moved. This also applies in the, in the field of healing. We have certain types of healing which apparently are largely sustained by the faith factor, others by reason, third, more or less, by factuality. Another name for factuality is force, and therefore all such healing methods as arise from factuality have greater force factors, and also usually deal with more objective, tangible, knowable kinds of energy. An example, for example, of for the moment, of factuality in the directing of life energy would be your magnetic schools of healing, in which the operator operates within a field of energy which is essentially physical and which he controls by a factual process. He handles it exactly as he would a chemical, and he directs his magnetism just as he would compound a prescription. His own mind makes a diagnosis. He then, by means of mental energy or will, he then directs vital force, either from his own body or from nature around him, in the direction of the neutralization of the difficulty which he has diagnosed. This is on the factual level. Philosophic medicine, of course, brings us a great many things and goes back to the oldest concepts of the priests, namely that healing is actually the establishment of the reason in a thing. Therefore, the power to heal the sick, according to philosophical systems, was the power to restore reason. All things that are sick are suffering from a kind of madness, whether they be organs of the body or the minds of people. This madness is a distension or a distortion, a disfiguring of processes. Now when a doctor advises you what to do, but does not explain to you why, he is doing exactly as the old Egyptian priest did when he bestowed certain abilities upon Pharaoh without Pharaoh having earned them. The doctor or the philosopher may cause you to take a reasonable attitude on a problem causing you sickness, not because you know why, not because you are a reasonable person, not because what he says is going to convert you and make you a reasonable person but simply because by doing certain things you can attain certain ends, whether you are reasonable or not. There is a kind of knowledge which depends upon the transmission of facts or the transmission of things, particularly those things which relate to separate or peculiar circumstances. These can be transmitted without an understanding or knowledge of their true intent. Thus, if the physician should tell you that what you need most of all is that you take certain exercise, you may do the exercise which he recommends, and you may improve your health without knowing why or how. You may simply be following a transmission. He has laid the hands of his reason upon your mind. He has told you that certain things are so. You have accepted them because he said they were so. You have performed them because of either faith or intelligent consideration of his advice. Therefore, you gain certain distinct and definite results. These factors apply not only physically, but to many levels of consciousness with which we are less familiar, and which may include, as the ancients believed, the transposition of mind uh, from the healer to the patient, by which he causes the patient to become intuitively or instinctively aware of certain truths, not because he knows them, possesses them, or has earned them, but because they are forced upon his consciousness temporarily in order that he may meet or carry some emergency. Now the next question is... Therefore, if the individual is potentially 
often a healer. How is he to know that this is true? How is he to recognize whether he is one of those who by nature or by inclination has such peculiar or remarkable abilities? Many cases have indicated how this particular operation works out. I've known a good many healers at various times in life and in various levels and conditions of society. Nearly always the discovery that an individual possesses certain healing abilities is accidental or spontaneous. Uh, the, I know one individual, for example, who was brought up and raised on a farm and found early in life that he had peculiar ability to help sick animals. As he proceeded on through life, uh, his uh, skill or his ability was called upon uh, by a human being, and he gained a uh, distinction that has remained throughout life. Incidentally, this particular man has won 26 lawsuits against the American Medical Association and is still practicing. No one has been able to stop him simply because he could prove every step of the way what he was doing. Yet at the same time, this man could not make a scientific statement of his own procedures. He only knows that he knows. He knows that he possesses certain instinctive ability to sense the problem of the sick person. And he also knows something else, namely that he is able in some way to direct energy. So I think we should say that the prerequisite ability of the healer is his power to control energy and direct it by his own mind or thought. If he is able to do this and do it in an effective manner, he is probably capable of possessing uh, a sphere of influence in the healing world. The Chinese tell us a little bit about what happens under these conditions, although the procedures are intensely subjective, and the average person never attempts to diagnose them. Uh, the old Chinese uh, sages, scholars, have left in their writings some very interesting formulas for the transmission of energy to sick persons. One of the points they made, which is an, again a point that is entirely parallel to biparacelsis, is that the beginning in most cases of the power to project energy is the creation of what they call a sympathetic image. And this is the power of the healer to create within his own consciousness experience a facsimile or a mental projection of the patient. He very often does not know that he is doing this, but he is creating within the vital atmosphere of his own consciousness the shadow, the chaya, the, the image of the sick. He is strangely, therefore, visualizing the person. He visualizes this person subjectively. If his visualization develops to a certain degree of intensity, Paracelsus points out that the image and the subject of the image can never be kept apart. This was the, this was a point very well made by Greek theology and is the basis of what we might term all religious imagery in the world of worship and veneration. No one, for example, among the more intelligent Greeks ever assumed that the great power or deity Zeus actually sat in his temple in the form of a deity of ivory, gold, and marble. Uh, as we know in the great tem temple of the Olympian Zeus. This magnificent figure, this magnificent image, was made by men, but it was made uh, after the thought 
form or projection of their own mind towards the nature and substance of the deity represented. And because it was made by a great artist, and because into this image the artist incorporated the highest convictions that he had of artistic law, order, and symmetry, and tried to capture his own internal visual concept of the qualities, attributes of deity. He created an image. He created a statue. Now, according to the Greeks, this statue had to draw to itself, out of the vital field of energy, a projection or power of the deity. For the simple reason that like attracts like, and no thing can be separated from its own likeness. No deity could be absent from the image of itself. This image did not capture, hold, limit, or bind the deity, for the deity might also be everywhere else. But it was always sympathetically associated with the likeness of itself. This is why primitive people are very much afraid of photographs and of pictures and will not permit their own likenesses to be taken. They sincerely and firmly believe that anyone who possesses a picture of them possesses the power to control them. Experiments made with sensitive electrical devices have indicated there might be more to this than we suspect. Some years ago a series of experiments were made in which photographs of persons were tested by very delicate equipment. And it was discovered that it was possible immediately to tell from the photograph whether the person was living or dead. Simply because when the person died, the photograph died. Why? Paracelsus gave a very long description of this went into great detail and gave hundreds of instances of the sympathy between things, and he called this sympathetic medicine. Your Chinese sage, therefore, supposing that he is going to treat the sick. Perhaps the sick person is a hundred miles away, a thousand miles away. Perhaps the sage does not know where the sick person is. This is of no importance. Because the sick person can never escape the image set up in energy by visualization. If this uh, very highly trained person, the musician, is able through internal meditation to clearly create in his own internal consciousness, the likeness, appearance, nature, and quality of the missing or absent person. That missing or absent person is immediately brought into sympathetic relationship with this image. If, therefore, the physician then directs his attention in terms of therapy upon the image, the person in turn, will experience the result. Now, Paracelsus made much of this, and so have all ancient peoples, although we have completely ignored it in modern medicine. Now, today, we often think of people. And when we think of them, and if they are sick, we are often recommended to send them a good thought. Now, what exactly do we do? We are not just simply closing our eyes, clenching our teeth, and tossing a thought out into space. In the first place, to a degree, the very fact that we are thoughtful enough to send the thought means that we have some rapport with the person against whom the thought or toward whom the thought is to be directed. <coughs> I use against there, not in the sense of evil, but against the magnetic field, throw it toward the magnetic field of the individual. Now, what is the thing that may cause us to do this? 
<coughs> perhaps sympathy. We're sorry for that person. We visualize internally their misfortune. We spend a few seconds reminding ourselves of their need. Uh, we experience to a tiny degree their misfortune. We shake our heads, sigh if they are very close friends or near to us. We are really quite upset. We suffer with them. And because of sympathy, as Paracelsus said, sympathy is the most powerful force in nature. The moment we are sympathetic to any living thing, we establish a magnetic rapport with that thing. We create an association. And regardless of where that thing is, or the condition in which it is placed, this sympathy remains. Now we know, for instance, uh, when a person, I was thinking of one simple example, of one of the world's most famous ones, and that is the death of Lord Horatio Nelson. Of course, Lord Nelson uh, was a man of very powerful mind. And when he was lying on the deck of his ship at the Battle of Trafalgar, mortally wounded, his one thought went immediately to the one woman whom he really loved, and that was Lady Hamilton. And in the same instant in England, she collapsed in a faint, screaming, Nelson is dead, or is dying. Instantly. This is historically reported, and comparison afterwards showed that this occurred to her at the exact time that Nelson was crying for her a few moments before his death. Thus, sympathy, visualization, a tremendous power had been set up, in this case, Nelson's urgency. A previous sympathy had, of course, already been established through association, so that the magnetic fields of these two persons were already more or less attuned to each other. This association, by means of which sympathetic polarity was set up, is exactly the same thing that the Christian mystic means by the sacrament of ordination by the laying on of hands. In other words, the laying on of hands thus forms the physical contact, which though it may later be greatly attenuated, still becomes an immediate available a rapport, or a zone of sympathy between persons. Example again, in psychometry, if you have a person whose sensitivity is sufficient, you place them in a room with a glass of water, and from the glass of water they will be able to tell you everyone who has been in that room in the last two or three hours. A certain amount of Energy radiating from the human body is captured by water, which is the most capturing of all sympathetic elements. Good example again is the crystallization of frost pictures on a window pane, in which energy moving through water is able to create these crystallizations in the process of freezing. Thus, motions of energy and the sympathies between them establish rapports by means of which, under certain conditions, we are able to create sympathetic contact more easily than at other times. This is, of course, very common and is uh, quite well recorded in the case of identical twins, where having actually uh, come from the same fertilized ovum, the sympathy is intense and extreme. They are practically one magnetic field separated only physically. Therefore, the occurrences, thoughts, energies, attitudes of one will very often be conveyed almost immediately to the other, even more so than in the case of the Siamese twin. Whereas non-identical twins may or may not have this sympathy, but sometimes do have it to a less marked degree. But our point is very simply this, namely the importance of the sympathetic fields and the simple fact that sympathy 
causes us to instinctively wish well to a person whom we may know to be in difficulty of some kind. Unfortunately, of course, the average individual is not a very well-trained well-wisher. As a result of that, he sends a very wilted and inadequate bouquet to his friend. <laughs> it is a passing thought. Or perhaps he's quite sincere. So he will carry his friend's difficulty into prayer. And before going to rest, he will ask divine help for his friend. Actually, here he has greater in intensity on the faith level. Now, what happens? Does this mean that a divine power has been released by this prayer and that some god, godling, or emissary immediately runs along an invisible wire and bestows a benediction on the person at the opposite end? No. The thing that happens is far more peculiar and intimate than this. Because the thing that actually occurs is that the total impression of the sincerity, the devotion, the request, and the faith of the person praying is made available sympathetically in the consciousness of the person to whom the prayer is directed or about whom the prayer is directed. Thus, the person who is to receive this impression receives the total impression of the faith of the person who has asked for the help. And with that total impression, something of the vital or visual content of that faith. Therefore, the total desire, the total expression, and the total faith of the person praying becomes internally available by sympathy to the other individual. He therefore takes on the total condition of the person asking help for him. He takes on the mood, which is that of sincere uh, supplication for assistance. He takes on the conviction of the person praying. If the person is very devout, he will know in himself that this other individual will receive divine help. And the thing that is transmitted is the knowledge of the person praying who knows this. And it becomes a polarization of self-knowing bestowed but not merited on the person who receives it. Thus the person receiving the prayer has the experience of temporarily tuning in to a state of faith precipitated by the other individual. This is a little difficult to make clear, but I think if you will give it more consideration at your leisure, you will see the point involved. This is the reason, for example, uh, why we uh, find very often what might be termed communal prayer over events, national disasters, prayers for peace, uh, uh, prayers of all kinds, and the conviction that united effort in prayer has peculiar benevolence. It is because, of course, if the minds of, of many persons or the visual imaging of many persons is directed upon one object, the sympathetic bonds which relate to that other person are thereby increased and strengthened. The separate prayers do not go. Uh, but the prayers are bound again into a unity by their own sympathetic content and are thus gradually increased in magnitude and power and may become collectively acceptable when no one individual in the group could carry such an impressive program alone. Now the actual situation then is this transmission of a devout belief that certain things are possible. And therefore, if several persons united in a cause or in a purpose unselfishly focus their consciousness upon one object or one subject, the increasing sympathetic bond 
uh, has an important effect. It creates a stronger energy sympathy between the subject and the object. Thus we can say that what generally passes for uh, absent treatments and things of that nature may have a certain energy significance. It is not that these treatments represent necessarily a complete solution to anything, but they do represent the fact that we are never separated from anything we think about. Now that gets to be a pretty big thought if we work it a little further. Actually, thoughts become realities in the life of the individual at a certain level of his growth. All this thought procedure, all this sympathy, all this interchange of vibrations belongs on the physical plane because mind is a part of body. But on the physical plane, this most subtle of all parts of the body is able to engender innumerable thoughts. It is able to create and visualize like Klingsor the magician invoking the mysterious form of the strange serpent maiden Kundri out of the darkness of the underworld. Thoughts invoke and the images that rise to our mental eyes or even not actual visual images but thought likenesses, thought intensities cause energies from space to center in the thought equivalents which we build. Therefore, if we think evil thoughts, if we, for instance, think of a person and precipitate dislike, that dislike can reach that person. Usually, however, our effort is mostly adulterated down to nothing by the fact that we do not know how to have consistent or consecutive thought energies. Now, uh, this brings us to another question that comes to us quite frequently, and that is this peculiar problem of mental malpractice. I have known more poor souls to be suffering from the very serious belief that they've got a mental enemy somewhere, that an individual, for reasons not usually quite clear, is just sending them the nastiest thoughts all the time. <laughs> Actually, experience shows that with the majority of persons, the thought images, except under the most laudable conditions, are not strong enough for one individual to seriously damage another, or except under a powerful emotional stimulation which almost always involves the principle of good, can they get enough energy together to have very appreciable immediate effects. That is why we say that the healer is just not anyone. And the individual who is able to project thought very clearly and very powerfully nearly always has a long background of discipline. And persons who have this long background of discipline are very seldom likely to send evil thoughts. Very, very rare indeed. What we send usually is just a nasty attitude. <laughs> and that nasty attitude is a passing hope that nothing good will ever come to the person we dislike. <laughs> But there isn't enough energy there to cause very much trouble. There isn't any more energy there than probably there is in the nasty thought the other person is returning to them <laughs> at about the same time. Under these conditions, what actually happens? The person suffering from the persecution complex <laughs> or from this feeling, is gradually, by negation, creating a mental image of the person whom he does not think likes him. 
and through his fear, but through the consistent and orderly enlargement and intensification of his own negative attitude, he makes this image very much stronger than it could possibly be, and can sometimes, by his own imagery, create a sympathy by means of which the other person can reach him and hurt him. But they could never get to him if he had not already created the dangerous likeness of that other person in his own psychic life. So we say to ourselves, that individual down the street gave me a very nasty look yesterday. <laughs> and in addition to that, voted for the wrong candidate the last election. <laughs> Also, a certain person told me that another certain person told them that this individual uh, was uh, very strange and that people who were around them very much didn't feel very good. Kind of like, you know, a highly civilized sort of witch or something. Like that. <laughs> so we start building the image. We start building it up. And by degrees, we transfer this situation into a very powerful uh, negative image, creating a reverse sympathy, in which instead of the person sending the image, we create it instead. And by sympathy, we associate it with the individual causing trouble. Now we have pretty much of a four or five way possibility here now can become quite intriguing when you start wandering through this mysterious borderland of man's ability to move energies. We create an image of this person. Of course this image looks very much like the uh, witch in, the, in Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. Regardless of appearances, this person has every unsavory attribute which we suspect them to possess. <laughs> now, it's quite possible, you see, that we are wrong. If we are wrong, then the image forms no rapport with the person. Because, after all, the, the sympathies are between things that are alike. And if we create a pattern, and the person we created about isn't like the pattern, no sympathy. Then, said little, says Paracelsus, where we create a situation of that kind, however, there's always something like it somewhere. <laughs> and if we don't happen to get old Aunt Matilda who cut us out of the will, and about whom we are sending some very negative thoughts at the moment, Paracelsus says we might even pick ourselves up a stray elemental. Something, some thought vibration from space that is like what we suspect the worst to be now creates a sympathetic relationship with us because we've gotten ourselves all set for it. We have created a kind of vibration and anything with that vibration will be touched like tuning forks. And it's quite possible that the only one who will not be touched is the one we aimed it at. Because we were wrong. We just made a wrong estimation of the individual, which is not uncommon. But having once created this situation for ourselves, we are in a double emergency. First of all, we have to gradually set apart, or set about breaking down by intelligence what we have built up uh, by emotion. And as uh, the two don't work in ratio, sometimes it takes a long time for common sense to break down what hard feelings builds up. We may be able to make a nice solid image there in a few days if we hate enough. But it's going to take the development of a whole new personality to love that image out of existence. So it's always best not to go too far with these things if we can help it. But assuming for a moment the horrible thought as being possible, that there is some truth in this, and that perhaps the image does uh, meet the requirements, and that the crime and the punishment meet each other, as the grand high lord executioner used to say in the Mikado. 
then actually, of course, we have given a negative factor, perhaps the negative thoughts of some person who does not like us. We have given them the key to the front door, brought them in, given them tea, and turned over the household silver to them and wished them well. We've done everything possible to make it possible for them to continue to rob us, annoy us, bother us, interfere with us, and be constantly on our mind. And, presuming the rapport was legitimate, that this other person is like the image and therefore becomes attached to it, whenever we think of, whenever that person thinks of us, we will think of them. Because we've created a pattern. We've created a nice little mess. That is why, according to the Buddhist doctrine of karma, no one can hurt us unless we do something wrong. That this other individual injured us really did us no harm. But when we build up an image, either accepting that image and making it real, accepting that injury and suffering from it, or creating a defensive image of that person to retaliate through by thinking about them, then we have built a bridge between these two lives and opened ourselves to the negative situation. Then brings an very important problem. What do we do about it then? How are we going to get rid of it? Well, one of the ways that we get rid of all of these images, of course, is by de-intensifying them, letting go of them. And mostly, the only way we can ever forget anything is by remembering something else. We cannot just simply sit around forgetting things. But we can create new levels of activity, mental and otherwise, on constructive lines which gradually starve the negative pattern to death through lack of nutrition. In other words, we turn the vital force away from it. And because this vital force is what keeps it alive, when we have that vitality in another direction, the image dies. There's no doubt in the world that a great part of so-called psychological phenomena, particularly obsessional and possessional phases, are due to these image, vital image forms because actually it is this energy which makes these forms live in our subconscious and gives them power to project themselves into our objective thinking. The law of cause and effect is working with these images at all times, and they always have to originate in some mistake that we ourselves make. Now we get the same thing to a certain degree, what we call the power of attention. We know, for example, that if we're walking along the street uh, very easily, very pleasantly, without being particularly aware of anything, and perhaps we kick a pebble, instantly our attention goes to our foot. We become foot conscious. If we have somewhat minorly hurt our toe why, by kicking the pebble, pain follows attention. And consequently, whatever part of the body we visualize, we create a magnetic sympathy with that part of the body. And it is this magnetic sympathy which is the energy that moves in a nerve. A nerve is nothing but a piece of wire. There's nothing there except the, a piece of wire. A piece of wire of itself does not carry a message. It is the message of a certain vibratory rate moving along the wire which constitutes the message. Consequently, what we call nerve reflex, or this, which is the power of the consciousness to center itself in any part of the body, is due to becoming aware. And by coming aware, to create subjectively and subconsciously an image in ourselves of that of which we become aware. Thus, for example, if we become aware of an apple, Back to that old apple again. That's such a convenient thing to use for so many ways. One on William Tell's little boy's head. One that did not drop on Newton's cranium. One that was involved in an episode in the Garden of Eden, which has been a cause of universal regret to Christian theology ever since. <laughs> now, 
The moment we become aware of apple, we create a sympathy, an attention focused upon apple, means that the attention is not available to be focused elsewhere. Attention, therefore, wherever it is focused, if it is within the periphery of the magnetic field of the human body, particularly the nervous field, causes awareness to center there, react from there, and give us the sensation of pain, or under some other conditions perhaps the sensation of pleasure, as in the gratification of the various sensory uh, functions and faculties. But wherever this awareness is, uh, we have this because of a kind of visual imagery within consciousness itself. The moment we think liver, we feel our liver, or become aware of its existence. Especially if we put the pronoun in front of it. If we think of our liver, there we become liver conscious. If we think of our heart, we become heart conscious. And all of the functions and powers of the human body are very shy and sensitive things. And they all function better when you don't think about them directly. If, therefore, you think about them and become aware of them or hyperly aware of them, you develop certain symptoms of hypochondria. You develop all kinds of over-interpretations of things which you would not even notice was not your awareness too much centered on something. And out of this we have a great many ailments which arise from the fact that awareness is always accompanied by tension. Wherever we are aware, we become intense. Wherever awareness strikes any part of the body, you have muscular reaction. And this muscular reaction will lock a nerve and then trouble begins. So in most conditions that affect the general health of the individual, both mentally and physically, hyper-awareness or the permitting of the faculties and sensory perceptions to visualize ailments, visualize conditions, visualize functions may result in the pulse listener and many other uh, chronic sufferers from phases of hypochondria, can even go as far as hysteria. But when some of these patterns take over, and we can no longer control the pattern, the visualization becomes stronger than the fact, then we have hysteria. It follows then that the mind creating these sympathetic zones is constantly releasing energy and that therapy, to a very great degree, is the uh, directing and integrating of the science of how to handle or how to administer these various circumstances. If the individual, through growth, through unfoldment of his own resources, achieves to the control of these powers within himself, he gains a certain degree of health or the possibility of it. But unless his power to visualize or his power to intensify constructively is greater than that under normal conditions, he will never be what the ancients called a magian or one capable of performing miracles or of performing extraordinary feats of the transmission of energies simply because he has not the intensity with which to hold the various uh, forms of thinking necessary to produce a strong phenomenal consequence. He therefore does not generally uh, achieve too much. But he may, by a certain science or certain study, increase this knowledge. When Paracelsus went to Constantinople, to study with the Arabic physicians who had already become deeply versed in the mysteries of magic and concentration and uh, the various yogic disciplines that were then being practiced for the dervishes. He said that he had finally found the answer to the mystery of medicine, namely that all medicine 
was a kind of therapy controlled by will and reason. That every part of healing was now nothing but the shadow of man's ability to directly control energies. He now tries to achieve certain ends by pills and poultices and by purgings. But whether he uses one of the newest and most up-to-date remedies or goes back to the old-fashioned leech, he is still using artificial means to correct causes that rise in the contemplative or rational emotional structure of the person. Actually, as the old Chinese sage knew, the physician sitting quietly at his table, without the patients even present, can, if he is sufficiently integrated, guard the health of an entire community. It all depends upon whether he has taken his medicine out of books or whether he has learned the mystery of releasing the physician in himself. Well, that is a pretty large order and we're not expecting anyone to get too busy at it all at once. But just as all things begin with an hypothesis or an assumption, just as we have begun to realize that nearly all forms of knowledge that we now possess have come from ourselves, and that we have locked within ourselves dimensions of potential completely unknown to us, it is not inconceivable that in the great future of things, the end of medicine will be the power of the physician uh, to create by will all of the phenomena upon which he now depends for he healing through the use of drugs. After all, a drug is only an artificial means of creating a modification in an energy field. We already know that under certain conditions uh, hypnosis can be used as a substitute uh, for anesthesia. Actually this is a key to the whole field of medicine. So there is not a drug today that we use for which man does not have the power of creating out of his own consciousness an even superior means of accomplishing the end. But this means great training and the restoration of the ancient secret formulas of medicine, which have been lost for a very great length of time. Now, of course, this all deals with the problem of the sick. But we have to go even a little further uh, into this matter, because finally the end of medicine is that it shall deal, that it shall deal with the problems of the well. Actually, all healing must result from an inequality in which one individual having greater skill, insight, knowledge, or means temporarily alleviates a situation existing in another person who is deficient in these means. Thus, theoretically, wisdom uh, may bring the less wise person through the crisis, but wisdom alone is the ultimate medicine and the individual must ultimately attain to the condition in which he is his own physician. He must finally learn how to so administer energies within his own body that he is in complete control of every process with which his economy is involved. Naturally, this is a very long-range picture of the situation, but it is also one that we uh, can think about and hope for and believe in connection uh, with the future of our healing arts. Now let me point out a peculiar phenomenon that arises, we'll say, in the, in the field of hypnosis. Under hypnotic influence, the symptoms of almost any ailment can be uh, communicated. In other words, the individual under hypnosis can actually experience the amputation of a leg and be perfectly convinced that the leg is gone. When he tries to put his weight upon it, it isn't there, and he falls to the floor. He is completely convinced that the leg is gone. There is nothing in the world that can change his mind except the operator. 
who must release him from this peculiar fixation. Also, the individual under these conditions can be perfectly certain that he experiences pain, misery, or a force of that nature at any point or part of the body which he is told is painful at the moment. Also, in this case, the hypnotist can also invoke or cause to appear before the subject at any time any person, likeness, or a thing which he so desires, so that an individual will go up to a person who isn't there and gravely shake hands with him. And as far as that person is concerned, that other individual is there. Also, this individual can be made to disappear. And there are cases where a hypnotized subject has been told that a certain chair containing another person was empty, and he promptly sat down on the other person. He did not know that other person was there, although his eyes were wide open, and he could lean over at request and pick up a pin from the floor. He had perfect faculties except where they were blocked. And he was completely unaware that there was any blocking. Now this has its bearing upon the problems of healing, the problem of health in general, because it indicates to us the tremendous possibility of mental attitudes as these relate not only to invisible things, but to visible things. It is perfectly possible for the individual to have certain visual things blocked. And it is quite possible for any collective concept to become an hypnotic force and block the individual's determination or interest in other things. Thus, for instance, in a field of learning, such as medicine today, a prevailing concept can block the minds of the most skillful persons to any ideas which they do not wish to ex accept. They do not become stubborn to these ideas as we like to think they are. These ideas are simply not perceivable by their minds. They can see all things around those ideas perfectly, but the idea area is a vacuum because they have blocked themselves by auto-hypnotic procedure, or been blocked by the collective pressure of attitudes. Thus in the life and health of the individual, we find a great many things flowing in to affect health, to affect the uh, happiness, peace of mind, security of persons. The moment these things flow in, if we take hold of them and visualize them and intensify them, they become greater. Until finally we create all kinds of rapports which are not suitable to our health. We can uh, take the most mysterious, ethereal, abstract things of nature and change them into malignant forces very, very easily. Paracelsus had a very intriguing theory. We're not advancing this as um, factual, but we're advancing it as something that might be uh, useful for consideration. Namely, that because the individual lives in this energy field which he can Move by will. He possesses an almost divine power. Because the creative power of the universe is the power of original motion. That which first moves, that which is not previously moved. That which first animates, that which has not previously been animate. Therefore, that which causes motion causes life, causes the creation of something which once having been caused cannot in any way ever end. Therefore, if we set a thought in motion so that it becomes a moving or acting thought, and here's where Buddhism comes in and reminds us that the thought of illumination is a non-moving thought. But if we create a moving thought, we not only create something which will have a continuance, but will have, from that time on, a perpetual sequence in cause and effect. 
because things continue only by cause and effect. And all motion moves after the original impulse only because of the momentum of cause and effect inherent in it. Thus, if you will remember in your ancient Greek, Egyptian, Chaldean theologies, the gods gave the primal motion and departed and nothing more was heard of them. They retired, having said, let it be so. From that time on, all things become self-moving. And the thing that moves them is the com compensation equation, which is the inevitable result of action. So in our particular thinking at the moment, the health phase of this, is that man is forever causing motion. It's a wonderful thing how he does it. He says, my gracious, that is a very stale um, piece of bread. I don't like it. Throw it away. Now that has emotion factor in it. Or he says, turn off the television, I can't stand it. That has emotion equation. Why are people stupid? That has an emotion equation. Why won't people wake up? Don't they realize we're going to have another war if we're not capped? Why don't they do something about it? We're off. Yet these motions, these energizing of attitudes constantly, don't go anywhere. The individual, five minutes later, has forgotten about it. And he's energizing something else. So he is a, per a per uh, perpetual leaky faucet with something <laughs> dripping out all the time, going nowhere, meaning very little, and accomplishing less. But what happens to this thing that he set into motion? He has done something. He likes something. He dislikes something. He loves something. He hated something. All these things are agitating, moving things. What happens to them all? Well, according to Paracelsus, this constant process of creating life and then neglecting it, throwing it away, doing nothing with it, forgetting about it, letting it to presumably dissipate in space, which it never does, because this vital field into which it falls does the same thing to this careless word that it does to the thought form that we send or the message that goes around the world without losing any of its definition. This little message that we send out is like our little shortwave radio. It just keeps on traveling. Now, therefore, with as many human beings as there are in the world, and as many notions as each one of them have, <laughs> you can realize that we have a rather congested atmosphere. <laughs> the crisscrossing of things is incredible. And on this level of psychic energy, we have an incredible chemistry taking place. A chemistry of which, in which similars meet and mingle. Dissimilars meet and conflict. And these things, like the famous primordial atoms of Leibniz, keep bumping around in time and eternity. But they are alive because we have given them life. And because only can a thing which has life in itself in the form of will, can it engender life. So these little things, according to Paracelsus, that keep going around forever and everywhere, actually are the beginnings of new orders of life that will never cease. They're like your primor primordial monocellular organisms. All life began in these sparks from a will action of some kind. And in a very early stage, when they are particularly mysterious and uh, difficult to analyze, Paracelsus came to the conclusion that these minute life particles, energized largely by the negative concepts of human beings, are what we call today bacteria. They are the beginnings of forms of life. And they are germs. And germs, bacteria... All these mysterious little minute creatures 
arise from these thoughts, and from a still more subordinate and incomplete level arise the virus of various kinds. These things are lives, living things, which originate in the psychic life of the human being in the energy field, and therefore having become living units of energy gradually clothing themselves in minute substances which can be microscopically seen in some cases and in other cases cannot be these uh, the, these then attach themselves to their negative similars in the human being and first thing you know we have a plague the each one of these bacterial <coughs> organisms arises therefore from a psychic entity each type exists primarily because of a negative emotional, mental, psychical focus of some creature possessing the will to energize negation. <clears throat> Consequently, these group, whether we know it now or not, and Paracelsus attempted to group them, although the knowledge of his time was hardly sufficient to permit it, except on an empiric level. But that hate produces one type, fear produces another, greed produces another, jealousy produces another. These things all set vibratory patterns in action. These negative patterns, then, become immediately reactive upon their sympathetic structures in creatures. And the jealous person is therefore open to the entire psychic field of jealousy. The worrier is subject or open to the whole psychic field of worry. The hater to the whole psychic field of hate. And these emotions reacting upon him again begin to attack various structures. Certain of these make the individual susceptible to ailments, and these ailments then move in, or being already present, are given the necessary means to amplify and extend themselves. This actually is apparent to us in the concept that we begin to sense dimly, namely that a good attitude keeps us healthy, because a good attitude does not open us into a sympathetic relationship with these negative vibratory factors. Now it may be hard to imagine that all of these things can come into the reign of feeling or into the power of healing as we know it today. So we come to another question that's been asked, asked many times. What is the relationship of healing power to the law of compensation in nature? And this is a, a very basic question, and one which I want to take a few minutes to work with. Do we have any right to heal an individual who doesn't deserve it? Now, the doctor will meet you right head on with that. And he will tell you that in all probabilities, an individual whose own mental attitudes and his emotional life are badly out of kilter is not going to be healed anyway even by physical medicine. He may have his symptoms temporarily allayed. But all healing involves some kind of growth. It involves the individual correcting, mending, or restoring something that is bad or broken, or of gaining a new insight or a new level of understanding about some phase of his own activity. Now, the, there are two responsibilities in this, one lying with the person who is the healer, and the second lying with the person to be healed, or who hopes to be healed. Actually, of course, if the healer was one of the old initiate priests, or one totally familiar with the entire field of the subject, he would have the discrimination, perhaps, or at least the integrity uh, to try to do that which is only good. But the same problem presents itself even here, because there is one thing that is locked to every human being, 
and that is the essential motivation core of another human being. We cannot know it, no matter how hard we try. We may feel that we can come to a reasonable estimation of someone else, but we can never be sure, and nor can we ever take upon ourselves the attitude that we can judge this other human being. Therefore, we can only follow the admonition, judge not lest ye be judged. For the judgment by which you judge is the judgment by which you will be judged. Why? Because the whole thing moves only in your own mental atmosphere anyway. And your very act of judgment will have its own effect upon your own psychic organism, much more than it will affect the person you are judging. The question then arises, what should we try to do? Should we just let people go on in their own miserable ways? The physician does not. Nor has any of the great philosophical systems advocated this factually. They have all assumed that there is an impulse in the human being to do good. And that this impulse, if normally and reasonably used, will not only benefit the individual using it, but is an essential part of contributing to the collective good of mankind. So consequently, supposing you send a very constructive, beautiful thought on healing to an individual who is sick because he has a nasty disposition, you might say to yourself, he doesn't deserve this thought. But out of Christian charity, a love of mankind or something, you send it to him anyway. Or should you send it? Should you send a beautiful blessing to this individual who doesn't deserve it? Well, the point is not important, because if he doesn't deserve it, he won't get it. His own psychic organism has no sympathy for it. It is dissimilar. If, however, this same individual, having passed through a very unpleasant episode, is in a moment of remorse, and is contrite and sincere in his realization of his mistake, and is sincerely desirous by the level of his consciousness uh, to improve some phase of his conduct or to correct some fault of his disposition, and earnestly asks for help inside himself only by admitting his own need in his own consciousness, that individual may then hold an attitude which is sympathetically compatible to yours. If by a natural and proper exchange, therefore, of these sympathy factors, a possible, just, proper chemistry is set up, it will set in operation because it will create a sympathy which forms a natural channel of like to like. And in nature it is always permissible that like and like should meet but not permissible that unlike and like should meet. <coughs> so that your problem of actually believing, presuming, which is not often the case, that you would have the power uh, to go against destiny, presuming that you had that power, uh, unless you make a vital mistake yourself, you cannot injure either yourself or another person by a constructive attitude directed toward them. The only danger lies when you over-motivate that and attempt to force a condition upon someone else. Then assuming, even, uh, that there is a sympathy, this forced condition will create a new kind of chemistry which will only be accepted if the other person is willing to accept it. But assuming that they are, then you can get yourself and the other person into trouble. Because the moment we try to force even good upon another person, we are guilty of sorcery. Because sorcery is the potential fact that it is conceivably possible for the strength of mind by tremendous exertion and skill to dominate a weaker mind. We know this in daily living. We know that the strong dominant member of a family can do this objectively. 
We know that habits, patterns, general convictions will do this collectively. Therefore, it is possible for mind to dominate mind. But the moment mind dominates mind, all sympathy is lost. Because there can be no sympathetic bond on that level. It is force. And it is the use of physical energy rather than psychical energy to force the mental action. Because as I told you, mind is also part of matter. And it is perfectly possible for the mind to be moved by the physical aspects of energy. If then we force or attempt to require or demand, then we are in trouble. Because if we can attain the end, then we take upon ourselves the karmic destiny of any life that we change in that way. It is no longer the person's responsibility for his conduct, and five lives from now, if he makes a mistake as a result of what we've done now, we'll still have to compensate for it. Because we have taken a position in relation to that individual which our own psychic life does not justify. The situation, of course, is modified to a very large degree by several things. Actually, it is very rare for it to occur by accident, inasmuch as the person trying to dominate isn't any stronger than the person he's trying to dominate. But occasionally it can happen. And of course, it is not true either if the individual who is being dominated is accepting that domination because of some secret motive within himself which is not good. And there's always the possibility of that. His motive determines his consequence. And to marry off on the degree in which he will be receptive to your domination. The chemistry gets very involved here, like everything else which has to do with the basic motion of life itself. But where, therefore, religious healing comes in, there has been interposed the concept that all these things lie in the hand of God. And the mystic asking for blessings for others or for security for himself always includes within his mystical contemplations that it is God's will and not his that must be done. Therefore, he protects himself against an, an aggressive mentalism which might lead him into trouble. Wisdom also modifies these things by the acceptance of its own limitation and by modifying its intensities by its own realization that it does not know with certainty what is good. Therefore, efforts are moderated to keep them within the fact of reason. On a factual level, however, you get a great deal greater amount of force expended and greater danger. On the scientific level, of, as, of an effort to break laws and patterns, because it is almost always on the physical level that the most obvious injustices take place. All these things remind us that if we, in our natural way, with only good, as a gentle purpose, <laughs> attempt to help others, we are qualified and rightly intended to do so. The physician is not karmically responsible for, heal for healing the sick. He is not karmically responsible for the use of such methods as he knows, or for such good as he believes. It is only when this procedure falls into conflict with his conscience that he becomes responsible. He is responsible only when he does not do that which according to his knowledge, skill, and place in life appears to be right. If, however, on the level of mental malpractice we exert a higher or more subtle force against the psychic economy of the individual, always with the possibility that its effect will not be consciously understood by the person receiving it, and also that this is entering into the inner subjective part of himself for which he may not have adequate defense, not even realizing that he should be defending himself and accepting the suggestion or the thought that we send almost as though it arose in his own nature. We are therefore within his defense mechanism, and any attempt to influence him in that area to any change of character should always be only with his own will and accord. 
he should never be secretly required to change, even for the better. He might, might, however, be asked or recommended to consider change. Under those conditions, we have no right to force change upon him. The only thing that we can do with him under those conditions is to send him in a gentle and non-aggressive manner through visualization a concept that he should be true to himself, that he should seek for the values in his own life, and perhaps the hope, the gentle hope, that the life within him will find ways to grow, and that the law will operate lovingly and perfectly in his nature to the degree that he permits. Therefore, always, the healer uh, uh, involves within the visualization process that he hopes these things if they are right. But if they are not right, let right be made manifest. Because we are not always serving people by getting them well. We are not always serving them by making them sick. Service consists in the individual being given the greater opportunity to release, release and manifest his own nature, in order that if it is good, it will strengthen him. If it is wrong, it will reveal its imperfections to him, and in that way assist him to grow. But healing sent without force directive is legitimate because it is the instinct of the individual to do good. But healing, forced by will, becomes a tyranny of one mind over another, and this is not legitimate. We do not know if the individual should be well or not, but we offer such resources as we possess to be used if it is right, if it is proper, if it is timely for him to change. Otherwise, we do not know. So if we keep our own intensities without pressure, without efforts to be judge and juror on anyone, even for their own happiness, we find we can make available a certain energy by visualization and sympathy, which this individual may use, not perhaps as we wish to have it used, but according to the greater good for him. So it is just as true on the healing level as it on the physical level that the greatest good we can do for a person is to help him to do those things which to him are next. And as long as we keep that attitude and keep it constructively, therefore the energies which we make available can only be good energies and cannot be used for evil. But the moment force comes in, evil is born. And wherever force comes in, suffering, reaction, and the violation of laws will complicate the situation ultimately. Well, there's a lot more to talk about, folks, but the time's up. So I think we try to fill a few points in the general theory of the subject tonight.